You've reached Hotel Pacifico, your five-star destination for BC Politicos. Press 4 for room service. Press the star key for your hosts, Mike McDonald and Kate Hammer. Welcome back, guests. Thanks for joining us again for early check-in at Hotel Pacifico. Good to see you, Jeff and Mike. Good morning. Good morning, Kate. Good morning. We have another another guest, another uh, new guest at the hotel today. I'm pleased to welcome the 35th Mayor of Vancouver and the 34th Premier of British Columbia, Gordon Campbell. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Kate. Nice to be here. We're very glad to have you and glad that you're going to stick around today for to join us for the Espresso Bar. Um, we'll do our usual check-ins. The leaders today, we have David Eby at an announcement in Vancouver that he's headed over to Surrey in the afternoon. John Rastad is at a rally in Surrey. Uh, I think we'll expect to see a lot of presence in Surrey, actually, in these final days of the campaign. And Sonia Furstenau is in Victoria for a rally tonight with David Suzuki. Uh Gordon, can I ask you just quickly as a leader who's who's been on tour before, what's a good day look like on tour during the campaign? Well, I think a good day is generally where your where your supporters come out and give you, you know, support and you get to carry whatever the message is of the day. Uh, I think, you know, by this time in a campaign, if the messages aren't out yet, they're probably not out. But uh, so I think it's actually interesting for me. I was thinking about this when I was just listening to you guys. And actually, campaigns have changed, I think, well, significantly since I was doing it. But one of the significant changes is the election is on a Saturday now. Mm-hmm. When I was first running, it was on a Tuesday. So by the last weekend, we were really like with our tour buses, you know, we were with the media, we were going to as many ridings as we could, but it was it was a much softer part of the campaign than the kickoff. <coughs> Excuse me. So... You know, I think that um, a good campaign is you, you, your people are there, they're enthusiastic. And one of the things that I think we often forget in the sort of the big picture stuff that you often hear the punditry talk about or the commentary I talk about is this is actually 93 elections. It's not one election. It's 93 elections this year. And I don't really have a sense what's happening in the Northwest, to be honest about it, or what's happening in you know, the caribou. I know some of the big issues, I think, unite everybody. I, I, I don't know them. I believe there are big issues that unite everybody. But it's a big province with lots of differences. And we tend to sort of focus on, well, what? how do we feel about it in Greater Vancouver and Victoria, or what I used to call Greater Vancouver and Victoria? And it's bigger than that. And you, Jeff, I think will remember this, probably just as a bare inkling for him. But in 1996, the the Rumor was that we, the BC Liberals, were going to win. And I can remember saying to one of my political people who was with me, it'll be a miracle if we win because we had no party when we started. So you have to build up parties. You have to build up, you know, infrastructure support. Uh, We didn't do as well as we could have in 96. We got more votes, but we didn't get the right number of seats. 2001, we did quite a bit better. Mm-hmm. I'd say that's the, that'll be the understatement of the show. I just want to mark that here. <laughs> well, was known for my, my modesty, Jeff. That's just the <laughs> Oh, we love humility here at the hotel. All right. Um, well, this is, uh, I mean, I, I'm interesting because it, it does make me want to talk. I love the regional point you bring up, and it does make me want to talk. And we'll come back to it a bit. But really, there was a lot going on on the island yesterday. Uh, just to recap, yesterday, the Conservatives were in Nanaimo for a rally. Uh, uh, NDP had whistle stops across the island um, and a rally with Carol James. Uh, I think w- the other interesting piece of yesterday was uh, the the Greens had a bit of their own candidate upset with a candidate being accused by the NDP of saying 9-11 was, a, was an inside job. Um, and then the last piece, and one we haven't talked about, which I'm keen to get back to actually, is the independents, because we did have Karen Kirkpatrick in West Vancouver, Jackie Lee and Steveson both releasing a big stream of endorsements, some big names there, and I think really... Um, you know, punching through in the end of the election to try and remind folks that they're there. Um, you know, are there are, are Karen Kirkpatrick and Jackie Lee? I'll start with you, Mike. Are they kind of two of the top independents we should be watching on Saturday? You know, as Gordon said, it's ninety three different campaigns, and it's hard to pick up the uh, the independence level of support from province wide polling. So it's really what's happening on the ground there. And Karen Kirkpatrick certainly running as a, a kind of a, a liberal centrist and pro she will be the competition to the conservatives in that riding. Um, she doesn't have a leader that's 
kind of floating her boat um, in the riding. She has to do it all herself. And that that's tough for an independent. And that's why only one's ever been elected in the last 70 years here. But, uh, it, you know, if she can, if she can create a movement locally, she'll have a chance. I, I'm skeptical. I think the conservatives are likely to win that seat, but she, she may make it interesting. Any other independents we're watching, Jeff? Well, I think Mike's right, but it's also uh, the reasons why someone becomes independent may not be important to v people who are deciding who to support on Election Day. And so Adam Walker, uh, I can't tell you why Adam Walker ceased to be a member of the NDP caucus. It was quite obscure. Uh, he was a successful local councillor. Now he's running as an independent. But what is the unique proposition he's got that the Conservative candidate might not offer or the NDP candidate might not offer in uh, in his place? It's a tough one. But there are some there who were very prominent, like Tom Shapitka, I think, and uh, Mike Bernier, prominent members for many, many years representing their constituencies. I think they're going to have a much better chance in a very tough uh, uphill fight to become an independent MLA. Yes, we've been talking about TELUS Living for a few weeks now, and I want to leave you with some of the key reasons this initiative stands out in the real estate market. One, advanced technological integration. TELUS Living properties come equipped with state-of-the-art connectivity and smart home solutions. Two, community-centered design. TELUS Living homes come in a variety of layouts and unit sizes and include features that foster community engagement, including community gardens, fitness centers, and co-working spaces. Three, affordability. Some of these homes are purpose-built rentals that middle-class families can afford within BC's household income targets. I could go on and talk about how TELUS Living units are built using sustainable materials to be energy efficient, or how they offer access to a diverse array of value-add products and services that complete the connectivity, health, and well-being experience. But I think you get the picture. By leveraging TELUS's expertise in bringing curated developments to our cities, connectivity, and innovation, TELUS Living is redefining what it means to create vibrant, sustainable, and connected communities. Thanks for setting up this frame, Gordon Campbell. Like this is, you know, the 93 races, it's across the province. Now we're going to the part where we talk about, we do talk about the metadata. Uh, this is Milking the Data brought to you by BC Dairy. Farmers need guaranteed access to water to feed BC. Mike, do you have some new Polara numbers for us today? Um, so Polara has been, uh, as our listeners have been following during the course of the campaign, has been doing a nightly track. Uh, for the last uh, four days, we're going to look at the last four days here, to about 250 interviews a night, a total sample of about 1,093 interviews. Half of that, around half of that's online, half of that's uh, IVR. So we got a horse race here. <laughs> and for those who might be thinking the NDP were pulling away, as I thought they might, uh, with all the negative media coverage, the polls indicate otherwise. Uh Uh, we've got the NDP at 42 and the Conservatives at 41 and uh, the Greens at 12 and uh, need my reading glasses here. Some other party or independent at five. Now, um, that springboards to the next point here, which is over a million people have voted. Woo -woo. As, of, as of last night, 1.1 million people have now voted, which is unprecedented in a, in a For advanced voting last time last election there were more than that because everyone voted by mail but but this time more conventional election uh, advanced voting is very strong i went back and uh, looked at past elections where um, turnout changed from one election to the other and the general pattern is that uh, a boring re-election uh, which gordon i would say 2009 um There were actually fewer votes in 2009 cast than 2005. Uh, but in uh, 2017, when the NDP ultimately took power again, there was quite an increase in votes, total votes cast. In 2015, federally, when Justin Trudeau came to power, there was a huge increase in votes cast. It looks like we're going to see an increase in votes cast here. I'm not going to go all the way here and say that means conservatives are going to win the election. But I think we have to factor in the... This phenomena, I'll call it that, of so many people voting in the advance poll, what does it mean? You know, uh -huh. now a lot of that, the highest turnout ridings are on Vancouver Island. Uh -huh. And um, there's four ridings on the island Oak Bay, Beacon Hill, Saanich North, Courtney Comox. 
that already 40% of the registered voters have already voted. So that's huge. 20,000 people in Courtney Comox have already voted. So I think one of the and a conservative strategists offered this uh, opinion to me, and I, I agree with it, is that one of the reasons why the island is so strong is there's three parties working really hard, right? And, and the Greens are driving turnout more so on the island than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But it's also older population. And I think there's a, you know, and it's also a very ca Caucasian population. There is a correlation usually between uh, those who've lived here longer or um, tend to vote uh, more um, at a higher turnout rate. But I don't want to throw too much into the analysis here just to say something's going on. Uh, we got a tight race. There's lots of people voting. Um, you know, let's uh, see what happens Saturday night. It's really interesting. I mean, I think you could pick out a lot of reasons potentially why you'd see higher voter turnout, you know, uh, in the in the early in the advanced polls. Um, you know, and a, a few things I could think of would just be changing voter behavior. I think 2020 was such a different election. I think a lot of people kind of maybe their their approach changed and the idea of advanced polls became more of a practice for them. Um, you could look at the fact that the election's on a Saturday. Uh, uh, and so now people sort of, uh, especially if you can get out of work on a weekday and get her done, you don't want to wait in line. But I take your point, Mike, in that certainly historically, there seems to be a relationship between turnout and appetite for change. Uh, and seems like something uh, something worth watching. I don't know what to make. I mean, I, I think the, the three-way race on the island probably is the the, why we've got the the island like way up into the 40s i mean most of these top writings um the top kind of 15 are on the island yeah. mm -hmm. it's astounding like go go vancouver island um well from a our, political perspective it's 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 something that's giving the conservatives reason for hope and i did see some conservative conservatives out on social media last night trumpeting this to say watch out folks changes on the way so for them it's a shot in the arm it gives their their troops uh uh reason to keep pushing you know uh because you can get down when the media cycles relentlessly negative your your people can get down and and when you've got something positive to say it, it helps everybody in the final push well and then yeah to, to marry that with the top line 42 41 this yeah. is a real race Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Are you an electricity generation provider with experience delivering projects in Canada? Our sponsor, Fortis BC, wants to hear from you. Fortis BC is seeking power providers to bring new or existing projects online and increase the amount of electricity available for its customers. Fortis BC has issued a formal request for expressions of interest for additional power to support the energy needs and economic growth of BC's southern interior, where the company delivers electricity. Some of our listeners might not be aware that Fortis BC owns four hydroelectric generating plants on the Kootenai River, which allow their over 190,000 electric customers to receive approximately 1,609 gigawatt hours of energy supply each year. They meet the remainder of their customers' energy requirements by purchasing electricity but they need more energy to meet the growing energy needs of its customers in the future. Fortis BC is looking for power providers with a focus on developing innovative renewable and lower carbon energy sources, including biomass, biogas, hydroelectricity, solar, wind, and geothermal projects. Fortis BC is particularly interested in new or existing projects that have a strong indigenous equity component or are indigenous led. Ensuring customers have the energy they need when they need it is of critical importance for Fortis BC. That's why Fortis BC is looking to add up to 1,100 gigawatt hours of energy supply as soon as 2030. To learn more, visit fortisbc.com slash new power. Fortis BC, energy for a better BC and a better podcast. Okay, let's move it along then. Because I am really, really pleased actually to have... Um... To have an experienced campaigner and someone who knows what it means to bring it across the finish line and win an election. And in the lead up to this election, uh, Gordon, you did write uh, an op-ed endorsing the uh, conservatives for this election. I'll try and summarize a bit of what that, you know, what you're what what you said in that op-ed. I think the key line here is, quote, the cost of living is soaring because the government is addicted to taxes, not to performance. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? 
Well, what I mean is, you, all you, you know, you have to look at the facts. Is uh, you know, all the politics and all the labeling and everything is really nice, but I think facts are better, right? So we have the highest deficit that we've ever had in the province, nine billion dollars. We have twenty-two additional taxes that were in, or sorry, over thirty additional taxes that were added since the NDP was elected. That takes twenty-two billion dollars out of people's pockets. And I think the myth that, you know, somehow or other, the other person is paying the tax is simply wrong. We're paying the tax. And when people talk about the cost of living, part of that cost of living is taxes. So our financial situation is not good. That's not Gordon Campbell saying it. We've had three successive credit downgrades, very similar to the end of the 90s, where we had five successive credit downgrades. Uh, our uh, revenue situation is awful. I heard the discussion yesterday about whose platform you're going to trust. I wouldn't trust either of their platforms at this point because, you know, we've, the NDPs had budgets. I, I love hearing Glenn explain why, you know, they have an established party and they've got a good budget. It's the same guy that brought in what was known in the 90s as the fudget budget, right? The fact of the matter is we don't know how much, you know, government is spending now. We know they've increased government costs. We know they've increased you know, administrative costs. And it's always the taxpayers who pay. It's always the taxpayers who pay. And that's the first thing. The second thing is, I'm all for, I think everyone that runs for office wants to actually do a good job for the province. Good. So were we looking for three credit ground grades? Is there, a, do we have to have a $9 billion deficit this year? Those are questions I think people have got to ask. And, you know, I think you go beyond that because it's not just that our, you know, we have a generational challenge in terms of our financial situation and our cost of living. Everyone knows that housing affordability is going further and further away. It's in the distance for young people. And I talk to lots of young people who tell me that they're not even sure they want to have a family because they're not sure they can afford a home or if they can, where they can afford it. And, you know, all governments of all political parties say they, they worry about affordability. No one defines what they mean by affordability. Affordability means, for me, means lower costs housing and you have more in your pockets to help pay for your mortgage or whatever else you're or your rent, whatever you're going to do. So in Vancouver, as an example, it's the place I know the best. 30% of all new housing costs are imposed by government. So don't stand up and tell me that you're caring about affordability when you're you're frankly, you're increasing costs. It just that doesn't work for me. That the arithmetic doesn't work. In healthcare, we have emergency wards that are closing every week. And again, we live in the Lower Mainland. If the General Hospital emergency ward cl closes, I can go to St. Paul's, I can go out to UBC, I can go across the, the bridge uh, to Lions Gate. If your emergency ward closes in Hundred Mile House or Williams Lake, you don't have emergency. You have to drive for four hours to get to Kamloops or Prince George and then you have to wait in the emergency wait lines in Kamloops or Prince George. And there's an awful lot of situations where you actually have to respond to these health crises quickly. If you have, a, for example, if you have a stroke and you're not responded to for six or seven hours, it's going to be a lot worse than if you have a stroke that you're responded to in an hour. That's something that's a collapsing system. And we have a government that says to us, I'm sorry. We're not delivering the health care that we have defined as, you know, in a timely way that we defined. The citizens didn't do that. But you may not go outside and get private care. In Quebec, they have that. In, in BC, we don't. So what do they do? They actually don't can't provide the cancer care in British Columbia. So they contract with private health care providers in Washington state. Those things to me are big, big things. We have to decide, all of us. Did we decide that government was going to make all of our health care decisions for us? Or should we have a say in that? Because right now we don't have a say in it. So, you know, I look at the cost of living. I look at the cost of housing. I look at the collapse of health care. I was away from Vancouver for a number of years. I came back. I can't believe what it's like on the streets in Vancouver. You know? I lived in Victoria for a couple of years. I can't believe what we find on those streets. And I'm not knocking, I'm saying that we should be able to solve this. It's not that we don't want to, it's that we haven't. And the steps we've taken have made things worse, not better. And in your life and my life, if we're making things worse, we change what we're doing. And I think it's, you know, we're, we need a change in British Columbia. If people think things are going in the right direction, 
they should support the government. I'm the first to say that. If they think they're not going in the right direction, they better change them. Because, you know, David Eby's last minute conversions on a number of things isn't going to change anything. So we've been actually having a lot of conversations about this, uh, Gordon, like we and I think you're pointing at something that we've 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 lamented, which is a lack of a real discussion of kind of fiscal uh, of economic policy and the deficit. And I want to because I, I, I think so we can say, you know, at the four, like it really didn't get the attention uh, and, and certainly balancing the budget and the size of the deficit did not get the attention. I think many of us att- uh, many of us thought it would in this election and probably the attention it's due. But underneath that, and let, let's pick this apart, because underneath that is, I think, consensus from both parties that these problems are huge, but a question about how you address them that comes down to different questions of spending and investments and efficiencies and what you do with the public purse. Looking at the conservative platform, I'm curious what you think looking at that, um, because if that's the kind of key distinction of the conservatives to say, we're going to be more fiscally responsible, we're going to support better economic growth, we're going to find efficiencies um, and, and end our dependency on some of these new revenue streams. Did you see enough there to feel confident that they'll deliver on that new approach? And I say this, too, as someone you, you know, you as a premier, I think, did a lot of work in this area. Well, you have to decide that you want to balance the budget. I'm, I I was not happy to see they wanted to balance the budget in the second term because you and I both know what happens in the second term. You tell everyone why everything's different than the first term, you know, and then then it doesn't get balanced. I mean, it, the easy, you know, I can tell you this, uh, and Jeff will know this too, and so will Mike. It's way more fun to be popular than to be unpopular. But you have to make tough decisions if we're going to balance the budget. And, you know, a bigger thing that we're not talking about today that we should talk about is the generation that follows us. Guess what? I'm going to be OK. My kids, not so much. My grandkids, even less so. It's time for us to think about what we can do. And the fact is, government in my lifetime, government has grown in cost every single year in my life. We have to get our government costs. You know, there are your costs. So if you feel like sending more to government, you know, just keep doing the same thing. But if we, what's important, I can tell you, if I live in the interior and my emergency ward's closing and my loved one gets hurt, what's important to me is healthcare. And healthcare is important to everyone. It's just, we don't all need it all at once, but that's important. The ability to react with those things makes a difference. I'm Hamas and this is Simon. And we live in Surrey. We started hosting on Airbnb because we thought we had the spare room and why not share it with people? When our guests come in, first thing usually they ask is, I'm really hungry, it's been a really long flight. Uh, Can you recommend a place? Usually Simon is really good with that. He knows all the good spaces. Because we got a lot of good reviews and people commented on the overall look of the space, I was like, okay, maybe I can do this for a living. It actually gave me the courage to start school in interior design. It made such an impact on us financially and I don't know, I think we're happier because we started Airbnb for sure. Learn more at airbnb.com slash host. Gordon, I'm keen to ask you a municipal question. I mean, we could go back and forth about elimination of medical service plan premiums or the, you know, creating child care, all the things that on the other side of the equation. But what really struck me in your piece was the suggestion, and you've mentioned it today, that the fees charged at the municipal level are too high. But those fees are designed to save taxpayers from the cost of putting in infrastructure and so on for new development. If they were eliminated, what would happen? And we see municipal leaders, and you were there, and you know um, how honestly they feel these things, saying they need billions and billions of additional revenue streams for transit and for sewers and for water treatment and so on. Um, looking to the future is the problem. Too many taxes or not enough revenue? And I'm, I'm not asking that to be cheeky. I just I, I wonder, because I don't think these people are making up these demands. I think they're real. Well, I think I think the demands are real, but I think we have to be rec- we have to recognize shifts. they're not really connected, right? So yes, I get where if, like we did a major development on the North Shore of False Creek, and the developer paid for all those parks. You can go down there and you can look at the parks now, look at the daycares, look at the community centers. For an awful lot of these, which are kind of infill developments, you cannot see that. And the the challenge I think always is to, is to at least be respectful of that. And it's it's literally 
hundreds of millions, <clears throat> hundreds of millions of dollars that they take. So, you know, it's, it's all very well to say everything is our top priority. Everything can't be your top priority. And I think in municipalities right now, I personally think there's got to be a fundamental shift in how governments work. Because, you know, everyone talks about immigration like it's just a federal issue. But, you know, over 60% of all immigration comes to Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, and uh, Calgary. 60%. Where are the biggest housing problems we have? Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, and Calgary. We have to deal with those. And and I don't think, you, uh, just as a, a news flash for you guys, first time you've ever, maybe ever heard it, you don't get any smarter when you get elected. You're still the same person who's elected. So you have to actually figure out who's best able to make some of those decisions. And I think lots of times it's local government. It's not the province and it's not the feds. And I think it requires significant change. The problem is, I think the biggest enemy we have in reestablishing the quality of life we have and the opportunities that I had when I was born is the tyranny of the status quo. The status quo pulls us back, pulls us back, pulls. We can't do it any other way. Nope, never done it that way before. We have to be up for change. And I think change is about leadership is about change. It's not about paddling the boat in the same direction you've always done it. You have to change stuff. And I actually agree with you, Jeff. I think you are in council in Vancouver. Right? Were you in council? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, nine years. Municipalities, we should be thinking of building government up from municipalities. You know, it's not 1867 anymore. I personally think that federal governments should stay out of health care, send the money, get out of health care. They know nothing about the delivery of health care. They interfere in the delivery of health care to people. And that's not what we want. I want health care for you, Kate, and for Mike, and for Jeff, when you need it, in a timely, professional, personal manner. We can do that. We just can't do it the way we're doing it right now, because it's not being delivered. It's just not being delivered. That means we need change. So on that on that point, Gordon, you know, you, you're obviously in a tough fiscal situation provincially, uh, and I would say a tough situation at the city of Vancouver, as an example, as well, where they're dealing with a lot of uh, significant property tax increases. When you became premier, and I believe when you became mayor as well, you initiated a core review and took a look under the hood of government uh, spending and uh, made some painful choices, as I recall. Um, are you recommending that to whoever gets elected here, that it's time to do a bit of a reset here? Because it's um, it does seem like there's a bit of drift here. Absolutely. Well, the last, I think it was the last quarter, there were nine times more people hired in the public sector than were created in the private sector and jobs. Who's paying for those? You know, and I think, yes, you have to do core review. My core review was both when I was in the city, because I did, I remember the first big, long budget council meeting, we ended up being a, like a marathon meeting, but we eliminated services that weren't required. In fact, we had we eliminated services that had been recommended being elim eliminated a decade before, and council just hadn't got around to doing it. So there are some things, surely there's something in all of government that we don't have to do. And I think one of the challenges with government is you say, well, we'll do 3% across the board and that'll work. It does not work. You have to say, what does government need to do and what doesn't it need to do? Stop doing the things 100% that you don't need to do and focus your resources on what you do need to do. You know, there's a, a, the myth that we have is everything is about politics. It's not about it's not about whether we all want a good healthcare system or not. We do. The debate is about how do you provide that. It's not whether we want a good economy or not. We do. I think Jeff, to go back to your point, sorry, I missed this, but we need to have an economy that creates wealth for people, that's more productive, that generates the opportunities that people need. And so, you know, I'm not claiming I have all those answers, but I know we can ask a lot of people that will have some good ideas. And then the debate is about the answers. It's not about whether we're trying to get there or not. And I think that I think a core review is a critical part of that. And again, I'll, I'll tell you, those are not easy decisions because you're dealing with people in all of these decisions. And how do you do that? How can you do that better? I think is, the, is one of the other questions we have to have. I'll tell you one thing. It is not the public services quotes fault that this is happening. It is political leadership's fault that it is happening. The reason we run for office, at least the reason I wanted to run for office, is so you could make decisions about how to do better things for your community, your province, and your country. That's why people run. That's why I ran for mayor of Vancouver. That's why I ran for premier. And I think we have to put ourselves in 
I used to put myself in the head of my mother. She was a school secretary. She has a school secretary's salary was raising four kids. And I used to think to myself, if I'm from the government and I'm taking more out of her paycheck, will she say that's better for my kids or could I do better with that money for my family? And I think we have to get back to that kind of fundamental question as well as what's important. Don't tell me you're for affordability if you're adding costs. If you're constantly adding costs, in housing, you're not for affordability. You're for something else, that's okay. But then let people have that discussion. Can we talk real quickly about the just the future of free enterprise? Because I think whatever happens on Saturday, there will be, you know, whether the BC Conservatives foreign government or or opposition, there is sort of a head, I think, um, a bit of a a bit of a battle to be waged over what the id of this new party is. Um, and I want to ask ask you, Gordon, like in particular, we have watched over the course of this election, I think some of the reason we haven't had some of this more robust discussion about economic policy and about fiscal policy has been because we've been distracted by a bit of more of the culture war type discussion. Um, is that something you see as um, a liability for the BC Conservatives going forward? And is this something they can move away from into something that is a bit more anchored in uh, running the economy well and kind of good bread and butter uh, conservative issues. Well, there's always going to be some of that, what you just defined as culture war stuff going on, I think, in in all the parties. I mean, honestly, if I look at the uh, BC NDP, I didn't think the way they treated Selena Robinson was good at all. I think it was actually reprehensible. And if I, I read her her column on the weekend, and, you know, I she's the one that says, you know, there's a real problem with anti-Semitism in the NDP. It's not me that said it. It's me. Now, I think there's problems in every party. And if you're going to have a big party, you're going to have candidates that are problems. That's why you have vetting. That's why you do a whole bunch of, you know, serious stuff. These are, you know, this is um, this is me being kind of old fashioned. I think it's serious to run for office. I think you better know what your values are when you run for office. I get people can totally disagree with you, right? I had, you know, obviously there were people in the new Democratic Party who didn't agree with my politics. I still liked them as people. I still thought they were good people. And you have to try and find a way that we create an environment where we don't let, I think your word is is great. We live in a politics of distraction right now. There are really big issues we have to deal with. And we're distracted by this. It's over here and over there. And, you know, it's a political strategy. You know, how do you distract how do you stop people from thinking about what's actually taking place and the results that they can have an impact on? So I think it, it's always a challenge when you're bringing a party together. It's always a challenge when you're trying to go forward with a platform. And one of the, that's why I say to people, usually you better be sure what you want to vote, what you're, what you want to do, not what you want to be. You know, everybody that's elected provincially wants to be in cabinet as Jeff, as Jeff knows, but that's not what you're running for. You better want to take care of your constituency. You better think of doing that job first. And then maybe you maybe you can get into cabinet. But it's really helpful if you know what you want to do before you run, because if you don't, you're going to have a thousand voices telling you what to do. Are you good? Are you going to be one of those voices maybe to help out if the conservatives do foreign government offer a bit of advice? I never offer advice unless it's asked for. All right. Thank you, sir. Let's grab let's grab a coffee. Okay, this is the segment of the show where we either you take a double shot at something you think isn't working or you raise a glass. It can be a latte or a cortado or whatever you drink to uh, to strategy you think is, is is good. And I'll I'll get Mike. Mike usually kicks us off. And I'll, well, I'll, off I'll start off. And mine's pretty generic. Well, it's just kind of nice, soft, fluffy latte today Love it. Uh, to the voters. Mm -hmm. You know, 1.1 <laughs> million voting in, in advance polls. And who knows who they voted for? Um, there might even be a few Andy peers, Jeff, that'll make you happy, but, mm -hmm. um, that's unprecedented. And it's, uh, I think it's a good sign for, um, you know, call it democracy in British Columbia, that people actually care enough to get out and vote early. So, so I will give a broad brush to the people this morning. There you go. Wonderful. Jeff. I'm going to, uh, raise a positive glass to all those candidates in those tight split ridings that Mike was talking about because they're waking up this morning going, is there anything else I could do? Maybe I'm losing and probably you are losing and maybe I'm winning, but you can dare to think that. 
Uh, you will never know what you did or did not do that made it possible for you to succeed or to fail. But uh, my heart goes out to all of you in those tight split writings because uh, I've had the, that near death experience. It's not pleasant. <laughs> Worked out okay for me, but uh, barely. So uh, yeah, hang in there, do what you can, but don't beat yourself up after E Day if it didn't work out the way you hoped. You probably did the best you could. All right, Gordon. Well, I'm going to actually underline what both Mike and Jeff said. Um, first, I think we should always say thank you to people for voting. I think everyone should get out and vote. The election is not over, even though there's been big advance polls. There is an election on Saturday. And I would hope that all of those, everyone here in British Columbia that can vote will take a day to think about themselves and what works for them and what doesn't and vote for the party that they think will be best for them. I happen to want change. I know how I'm going to vote. But, you know, that's, it's really important to vote. And I have another group that I want to raise my cup to, I guess. Right here's my cup. Um, and that's the people that are running for office. doesn't matter what party you're running for. It doesn't matter if you're running as an independent or BC conservative or a new Democrat or an upside down pancake maker. You're running for office. And there are so many people that used to come to me when I was elected and say, why can't we ever get anyone good to run for office? Well, I had two responses to that. The first one was, hold it, I've been running for office for a long time. And the second, <laughs> the second one was this, why don't you run for office? Can you do better than the people that are, oh, yeah, I can do better. Well, then run. You're capable of running. We give people the chance to run and make a difference in their lives. And there's a whole bunch of people across the province, every part of the province, that have said, I'll take a try. And I think we should recognize how important that is. And they are for doing it. That's fantastic. It's funny, actually, I was going to initially I was going to uh, echo I was going to do what Mike was going to do and raise a foamy latte to the voters. And then I kind of pivoted and thought I was actually going to talk kind of like Jeff. I wanted to talk to about the independence in particular, um, uh, you know, the Karen Kirkpatrick yesterday um, really for punching through and what is, I'm sure, a real slog. Um, finally, I'll just say then and I'll marry it all that I we are entering a new phase we are entering a new phase, guests, where we get into more of the analysis of what happened and the Rorschach block test of sort of people looking at the result and seeing the shapes they are prone to seeing within them. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Gordon, to your point, <clears throat> as we do that, I think at Hotel Pacifico, we're going to do a lot of work together to make sure we're keeping each other honest, having some humility and, you know, realizing that it's really easy to see the shape you think you shape and you saw in these results. Um, and really at the end of the day, um, it's hard to know what these things are, these elections. And I'm excited to be here at the end of this, this period, Gordon Campbell, thank you so much for joining us for this penultimate episode, a, a penultimate yeah. episode of our election coverage. It was a pleasure having you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Good luck to you guys. All right. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all our guests for joining us for episode 17 of our daily election podcast. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsors, Fortis BC, Airbnb, and BC Dairy. We will see you Friday, guests, for our last daily episode of this election. Because BC, you can never leave. Check out time at Hotel Pacifico. We hope you enjoyed your stay.